to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ of all the questions that are asked in scripture None is more important than this one. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31. Of all the fundamental studies that we might look at, none could be more fundamental than knowing what one must do to be saved and to ultimately live in that place called heaven. Friend, we welcome you today to our study of God's plan of salvation. We hope that you'll get your Bible out and be ready to look along with us as we study the Word of God together. As always, today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit with them. If you've got a Bible question, maybe related to salvation, or you've got a, you'd like to study the Bible more, they'd be happy to sit down and just open up the Bible and search the Scriptures with you. We're also glad that you've joined us today as well with the Gospel of Christ program, and we hope that you'll stop by and visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From that website, you can find a host of uh, Bible study materials. We have all of our lessons, whether in video or audio or transcript form, on the internet and you can access those 24 7 from the website everything we do is available free of charge if you'd like to have a hard copy of today's lesson in audio or video we'd be glad to send that to you free of charge just visit our website or contact us at the information given at the end of this lesson and at the gospel of christ and especially as we think today about salvation friend we want you to know we're not concerned about money or dollars or things like that like you hear on a lot of programs, we're concerned about your soul. And more than anything else, we want you to do what the Bible says. We want to do what the Bible says, and we want men and women to go to heaven. Let's begin thinking about that supremely important question, what must I do to be saved? This is asked at least two other times in the New Testament. When the Jews realized in Acts chapter 2 that they had killed their own Messiah, they turn to Peter and the rest of the disciples and they say, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them exactly what to do to be saved. This also came up in Paul's life, who was formerly Saul. In Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6, the Lord confronts Saul on the, on the road to Tarsus, on the road to Damascus there. Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. And Saul, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Lord, what would you have me to do? And so let's just simply think this morning about what is it God says a person must do to be saved. And friend, I'm, I want you to listen real carefully. We're speaking on these things because it's such an important subject, but I want you to know our motive in doing this. More than anything, we want you. We want to go to heaven, and we want all who hear this lesson to go to heaven. Our motivation is out of love. The Bible says God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Friend, I will assure you, at the Gospel of Christ and in the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ, we want men and women simply to go to heaven. Our motive is simply to say what the Bible says. I know full well there are a lot of ideas from men about salvation. Friend, it's not man who's going to save me and you. It's not man's doctrine. No human being has ever, outside Lord Jesus Christ, no person can make the sacrifice for your soul. God did that. And so what matters is, what does the Scripture say? Romans 4, verse 3. Let's then turn our attention to the plan of salvation. What is God's plan of salvation? For a person to be saved, naturally, he must hear what he needs to do to be saved. 
And the Scripture teaches that hearing God's Word is an essential part to salvation. Romans 10 verse 17, the Bible says, So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That passage teaches us to have faith. I've got to hear God's Word, but this is essential in salvation because faith is essential. Do you remember Hebrews 11 verse 6? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now think about this with me. If faith is essential, and it is, whatever way I get faith is essential to salvation. How do you get faith? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, when we say hearing the Word of God, what does that really mean? It means that I accept and I understand this book is God, the Bible is God's voice, final voice on salvation. That it's all I need to get to heaven. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, God has given to us all things for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us. Friend, when we talk about salvation, this is the book you need. This is God's Word. What man says, what man thinks, what people have written, this is what I'm going to be judged by. Jesus said in John 12, 48, He who rejects me does not receive my word, has that which judges him. The word that I've spoken will judge him in the last day. And so practically speaking, here's what it means in a practical sense when we talk about hearing the word of God. It means that I must listen very carefully to the Word of God. Luke 8, 18, take heed how you hear. Mark chapter 4, verse number 24, take heed what you hear. And then, of course, Mark 9, verse 7, God said, This my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear Him. I want to let God's voice be the voice that I hear, and regardless of what anybody else teaches, all that matters is, what does the Scripture say? Romans chapter 4, verse number 3. And so, are we listening carefully to the Word of God? Are we recognizing its authority as the final authority? And then, friend, we'd be amiss if we didn't mention this. Hearing means I have to prove what I hear is true to the will of God. Let me give you the best example I could think of. I want you to look in your Bible with me in Acts chapter 17, verse number 11. As I think about, okay, what is Bible hearing? What does it mean to really hear the Word of God? And is there an example of that in Scripture? Here it is. The Bible says in Acts 17, 11, These, the Bereans, were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word with all readiness, and search the Scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Now, you kind of set the scene in your mind. Use your imagination as you think about what's going on here. Paul goes into Berea, and he knocks on the door, and he says, I, I know you've heard some things about me. I've transformed my life. I'm here to tell you about Christ. They shut the door in his face, and they say, no, we're not interested. No, they received the Word with all readiness, meaning... They were alert and eager to hear if it was a message from God. And so they said to Paul, come on in, sit down. They sat down, Paul sat down, and Paul began to teach about Christ. What did they do next? Did they immediately buy what Paul said, lock, stock, and barrel? Nope. They said, Paul, we appreciate you coming today. We've heard what you had to say. We've taken notes. And then listen to Acts 17, 11. They searched the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Friend, this is so pivotal, especially in our day and age today, to understanding God's will. With the variety and all the many flavors out there that people promote about salvation, what matters is, am I willing, in hearing the gospel, to search the scripture for myself and make sure it's true to the will of God? Then let's talk about a second part in God's plan of salvation, and that is, I must believe in Jesus Christ. Do you remember Hebrews 11 verse 6? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to him must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Can I please God without faith? What is faith? It's commitment, it's belief, it's trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus taught us the importance of believing. In John 8 verse 24, Jesus said, Unless 
You believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. Must a person be committed to, 100% committed to the idea that Jesus is the Savior? Absolutely. In Acts chapter 8, as Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are, are in the chariot traveling down the road back to Egypt, he, he's heard the gospel. And, uh, or Ethiopia, hears the gospel. And in the water, he knows what, in the distance, he sees water. He knows what he needs to do. Here is water. What hinders me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Acts chapter 8, verse number 37. Always saying belief is something you do to earn salvation. Friend, don't misunderstand me here. No different than hearing the Word of God, repenting of sin, confessing, or being baptized. Belief is a, a requirement. But it's not something I do to earn salvation. Is it a work? Yes, it's a work from God for man, but not a work of merit where I can say, I believe, now I deserve it. John 6, verse 29, Jesus said, This is the work of God that you believe on Him whom I have sent. And so is it a condition set forth from God? Absolutely. But friend, I also want you to listen real carefully. And there's a verse that I want to point out here, and I hope you're listening to this. There are a lot of people that say, in our world today, and it's so sad, a lot of people say, all you've got to do to be saved initially is believe in Jesus. I hear it, you hear it, I, I know people that say it, and you know people that say it. You want to be saved, just be believe in Christ and you'll be saved. Now friend, don't get me wrong, belief is essential, but does the Bible say faith only saves? Did you know that the only time faith only is used in the Bible, it says it does not save? That's right. A host of people in this world are teaching all you've got to do to be saved is have faith only and the doctrine of faith only is very prominent today but the only time it's used in Scripture God says faith only will not save you. Now let me show you from your own Bible. Look in James chapter 2 and I want you to notice verse 24 with me. What does the Scripture say here? The Bible says, You see then, the man is justified by works. Now notice this. And you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Friend, the only time in Scripture the words faith and only are paired together, God says they will not save. And so, yes, belief is essential. Yes, it's a, a condition set forth from God, but alone, the Bible teaches it won't save. If I just stop there, I've stopped short of what the Scripture says I must do to be saved. And then that leads us right into the third condition God sets forth. If a person is going to be saved, must he repent of past sin? Let's ask it this way. If I'm going to be a child of God and a Christian and live like God wants me to, can I keep living in sin? If somebody's a, a bank robber or a drunk or a murderer, to become a child of God, must they stop doing that? Well, anybody with common sense says, sure, you can't keep living like that and be a child of God. And friend, that's what Jesus said. Luke chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus said, repent or perish. Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. But what is repentance? Here's a real easy way to remember repentance. Repentance is a, repentance is a changed will that leads to a changed way. Or put it in another way, repentance is a changed way of thinking that leads to a changed way of acting. That's all repentance is. When I repent, I change the way I think and I change the way I act. Matthew 21, verses 28 through 30, Jesus told an illustration of a father who had two sons. He said to his first son, son, go work in my field today. The, father, the son said he would, but never did. Then he said to the second son, son, go work in my field today. He said he wouldn't, later regretted it and went and worked in the father's field. Jesus said, which of those two did the will of the father? The one who said he would and never did or the one who said he wouldn't? Changed his mind and changed his action. Well, you know which one. The one who changed his way of thinking and changed his way of acting repented and went and worked in the father's field. Jesus again emphasized the importance of repentance. Certain people came to him and they said, and they're looking at people who they think God's divine wrath has been uh, exhibited upon, and they say, Lord, what about these Galileans who had their blood mingle with their sacrifice? Meaning at the time of sacrifice, they were killed. Weren't they worse sinners than everybody else? Or, or what about these people who are walking down the road, this group of people walking down the road, and out of nowhere a tower falls on them and crushes them? Weren't they worse sinners than everybody else? You know how Jesus answered both those questions? 
I tell you no, but unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Acts 3 verse 19 says, Repent and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Acts 2 verse 38, Peter preached in the very first gospel sermon, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Friend, it's also important for us to mention that while we think about repentance, and repentance does have a sense of sorrow, please understand that sorrow alone is not real repentance. Here's what we mean by that. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 10. The Scripture says, Godly sorrow produces repentance. Now listen to that again. Godly sorrow produces repentance. The Scripture does not say godly sorrow equates with repentance, is repentance. Rather, when I'm sorrow in a godly way, want to do what God wants me to do and change my way, that sorrow leads me to repent, which is to change my thinking and change my way of acting. Sometimes we see maybe in the media or things like that, somebody gets caught doing something and they have this great uh, emotional outpouring, but then they go back and do what they were doing is just having an emotional response repentance. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, but it does not say it in and of itself is repentance. Now let's talk about a fourth condition that God sets forth in this fundamental study on what must I do to be saved. The fourth condition God sets forth is we must confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. Where do we find that in the Scripture? A couple of passages to mention for you. Romans chapter 10 verse 10 says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, sometimes when we talk about confession, because of some false ideas that are popped in our world today, people hear this idea of confession and they think they need to go get in a cubicle and tell somebody their sin. Well, that's not what we're talking about. We're not going, we're, the idea of getting in a cubicle or in some box and telling somebody across the screen or the window from you, your sin is foreign to the teaching of the New Testament. When we say confession is a part of salvation, what are we to confess? Well, that second passage I mentioned tells us. Listen to Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. Jesus said, Whoever confesses, and here's the content, Whoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever does not confess me before men, neither will I confess him before my Father who is in heaven. What am I to confess with my mouth? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and the Savior of the world. Two times that happens. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, Paul said of Timothy, He made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And then again, Acts chapter 8. Philip told, the, or Philip told the Ethiopian eunuch, If you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. And he said, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And now, friend, we come to that fifth condition. God sets forth about salvation. What is it? The Scriptures teach that for a person to be saved, he must be immersed in water for the remission of sins. Let's, let's talk about a couple of things related to that. And again, friend, all we ask of you today is check your Bible and see. You see if these things are true to the Bible. If they are, obey them because God said them. What is baptism? You look up a dictionary meaning of baptism and it may give you uh, two or three different ideas. Some dictionary meanings will say baptism is pouring, sprinkling, or immersion. Well, I'm not looking to the dictionary today to learn what to do to be saved. I'm looking to God's answer in the Bible. What, how does the Scripture define baptism? In the Scripture, baptism is only defined as immersion. Now, let me give you some examples of that. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, Jesus is here baptized by John, and the Bible says this. At Jesus' baptism, the Bible says, And coming up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Question to come up out of water, what must you first do? Go down into water. Immersion. And again, John chapter 3, verse number 23. 
John was baptizing in Anon near Selene because there was much water there. How much water does it take to sprinkle or pour a little on somebody's head? Not much. John could have done that anywhere, just take a little water with him. How much water does it take to immerse, put a full-grown adult completely under the water? Much water. A couple of other examples found in Acts chapter 8, verses 37 through 40. You've got the example of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. They, the Bible says they stopped the chariot. He's traveling back to Ethiopia, dry, parched land. They stop the chariot. They both get down out of the chariot. They both go down to the water. He baptizes him, and they come up out of the water. Why did they both get out of the chariot? Why did they have to both get in the water? If sprinkling or pouring would work, they could have sent a servant to go down to the water. Why did everybody get in the water and everybody come out? Why did they stop the chariot? Again, the idea is immersion. Now, here's the clearest passage of all. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 teaches that baptism is likened to a burial. We're buried with Christ in baptism. And so Paul uses the illustration of a burial. What happens at a burial? They don't do this. They don't set the body on the ground and sprinkle a little dirt on it. They don't take a cup or two and pour a little dirt on it. What happens at a burial with a body? That hole is dug. That body is encased in the ground. Dirt on the bottom, dirt on every side then it's covered up. It's completely entombed, enclosed in the ground. And thus, when Paul used the illustration of a burial to represent baptism, friend, that teaches us that it is a complete immersion in water. But what is the purpose of baptism? Friend, again, I understand and I know full well that a lot of people teach baptism is a good thing you ought to do. Baptism is something you ought to do after you're saved. Baptism, you ought to do it like Je just, because, just to follow Jesus. But so many of those people will say, baptism, not essential to salvation. Friend, I want you to listen carefully just to what the Bible says. We want you to see for yourself from the Scripture that the Bible teaches you're not saved before baptism. Baptism is essential to salvation. What passages teach that? Would you look in your Bible with me in Mark chapter 16? And I want you to look at verse number 16, probably the clearest to teach. Baptism is essential to salvation. It's found in the Gospel of Mark chapter 16. Listen to verse number 16. Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. If you don't believe, are you a candidate to be baptized? Well, of course not. And so if you don't believe, you're already in a condemned state. But think about what Jesus did say. Je did Jesus say, he who believes will be saved? Yeah, that's what he said. Did Jesus say, he who's baptized will be saved? Not what he said. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Friend, all I ask you is, does your Bible say that? Does your Bible say, He who believes and is baptized will be saved? Second passage I'd like to direct your attention to is found in the Gospel of John. Let's hear the words of Jesus again. And I want you to look at John chapter 3. And I want you to notice what Jesus says beginning in verse number 3. Jesus answered Nicodemus and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And listen to this. Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You know, sometimes people say, Baptism is not essential. You don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. What did Jesus say? Unless, if and only if, one is born of water and and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, are those just the only two passages in the Bible? No, they're not. There are others that teach this exact same idea. Would you look in your Bible in Acts chapter 2, verse number 38? Again, we want you to see it for yourself. Look in Acts chapter 2, and I want you to notice what the Scripture says in the very first gospel sermon preached. Acts chapter 2, verse number 38. 
They've just asked Peter and the rest of the disciples, men and brethren, what must we do? And here's the answer. Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What's baptism for? What's its purpose? Why be baptized? It is for the remission of sins. Acts 22, 16, Ananias came to Saul and he said, Saul, Saul, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friend, just consider with me for just a moment. Does the Bible teach sin separates me from God? It absolutely does. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, sin separates us from God. If I can know when the moment in time occurs, the moment in salvation when sin is removed, I can know when I'm in a safe state with God. Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, probably one of the clearest of all is found in 1 Peter 3, 21. Peter says this, and you can't get any clearer than this. Baptism, there's a like figure which, which does save us, baptism, or as the New King James says, baptism does now also save us. Not the remove of the oath of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. When God says be baptized, I answer with a good conscience by doing what God says. And so does Peter say, you look in your own Bible and see, does the Holy Spirit say baptism saves us? If it says that in your Bible, then friend, I'm responsible and you're responsible just simply to do what the Bible says. Are we saying there's something mystical or magical in the waters of baptism? That's not the idea. If, if it were in the water, I'd live in the water all the time, wouldn't you? But it's not the water. It's not the mystical, magical idea. It's the answer of a good heart toward God, a good conscience. When God says do it, and I do it, I've been obedient to the will of God and I've done what He says. Have I earned salvation? That's not the idea. The Bible says in Luke 17, 10, and you, when you've done all those things commanded, you say, I'm an unprofitable servant. I've only done that, which was my duty to do. Must I obey God? Sure. Have I earned salvation? Of course not. If I'm saved, it'll be by the grace of God, but grace and faith go hand in hand. By grace are you saved through faith. And so friend, we encourage you today, if you've never obeyed the gospel, we love you, God loves you. Won't you obey the gospel today? and become a Christian. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.